Welcome to Bespoken Bones with your host, Parvani More, connecting ancestors, sex, magic, and science. Parvani explores transpersonal tools for erotic wellness every new and full moon, engaging educators, healers, spiritual leaders, and scientists in revolutionary dialogue. Get ready to feel good and go deep. This is Bespoken Bones. Hi, and welcome to Bespoken Bones Ancestors at the Crossroads of Sex, Magic, and Science. We're in the business of healing trauma, connecting with our roots, and developing radiant erotic wellness in past, present, and future generations. And I am your host, Pavani More. And today, it's super fun to introduce you to Kuk Teflon, high priestess, root worker and healer, intuitive teacher, and ancestor magic. Kook, formerly Miss Oblivious, has been documenting her surroundings through photography, words, publishing, zines, film, collaborations, and other visual arts since 1993. Beyond the photography of events and performances are her collection of individual portraits that seem to capture the true temperament of her eccentric peers. And she writes, I was raised by fierce Hungarian women that taught me the ways of the old country and ancestor magic. My practice started in the mid 80s when I was 14 with the help of my mother and her teachers. Accompanying her for tarot gatherings, metaphysical workshops and classes. For a short time, I would give past life readings to guests when I was 16. And in 2003, I began to fully embrace my relationship with the dead through intimate encounters and telling their stories. I began to focus on the healing to help others through mediumship, Kabbalistic praxis, intuition, plant life, and spirit baths and remedies, and also altar building and tending. And so I would really like to um, ish you a very warm welcome to Kuk Teflon and tell you that uh, you can find out more about her work at on her website at um, www.kookteflon.com. I'll spell it K-O-O-K-T-F-L-O-N.com. So Kuk, welcome so much to Bespoke and Boats. Happy to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you here. We've we've um, we've been coordinating this for a while, and <laughs> it's good. Yes, it's good. yes, yeah. for sure. And I'm um, very excited. I, yeah, I I wanted to ask you first about your practice of listening to the spirits because you wrote to me that um, you had a dream about your grandmother and your mother, and then you you woke up and you found the invitation to the podcast in your email. So yeah, what's your what's this practice like for you of listening to the spirits? For, for one, it's my relationship with spirits. So I have a very deep relationship with my ancestors, but also with the other spirits that I practice with. And I feel like a combination of all of them are basically my backup. So I just trust that uh, what I'm hearing is a message that's going to make sense, maybe not right at the moment, but in, you know, currently in the next few weeks. So um, a lot of times, like with my medium readings with other people, I'll get messages and I'm like, what in the heck? You want me to tell this person hungry man TV dinner, Salisbury steak? And I'm like in the middle of this like intense, you know, reading with somebody. And then I tell them that and they're like, oh my God, my grandfather ate that every night or something, you know? So I just really have a trusting relationship with the spirits. And um, I feel that my, my gift really began with listening to my dreams and paying attention. And obviously it's not every single dream and every moment of a dream, but it's those ones you have where when you wake up, you're like, whoa. And a lot of times what will happen to me through a dream state with messages is like, I'll have that dream a couple nights in a row or continuously over a month's time. And I'll know like, okay, pay attention, go re- give this message to the person that's, you know, contacting me in the dream or if the ancestors are communicating with me, um, pay attention to my surroundings and such like that. So if that makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. I'm curious about like your relationship with consent in all of that. Big time boundaries. Um, I didn't have them though until a few years ago. I did a six week uh, workshop with Susan Dumet. She's out of Seattle and it was all about being a medium and having the boundaries with the spirits. And so level one is like, I have a very deep, I'm a devotee of Hecate and she's a protector of outcasts. 
And so I feel very connected with outcasts. I am part of the outcasts, but also I don't want just all the outcasts. So, you know, I have conversations with her and relationships so that she helps keep those boundaries. I can't put that all on my ancestors either. Like grandma doesn't want to sit around and be like, oh my God, Joe Schmo wants to come and hang out. I don't want to deal with him. So Hikate has got, I feel the power and the experience to do that for me. And um, I have a trusting relationship with that. And I'm also like very vocal about my boundaries with spirit. You know, I'll say it out loud. I'll put those uh, prayers and wishes at the altar. And so the boundaries are like, I I explained it to a lot of people, you know, you're not going to, well, sometimes you will, but continue letting somebody like one of your old friends that's not been doing well and they're drunk and smelly. They haven't showered, sleep on your couch for nine days. Well, why would you let spirit do that? Right? So it's like having this whole other level of thinking with spirit as also you would with the living. Like I wouldn't let, I wouldn't allow that to happen in my own because it's my safe space and it's my safe space from the living and the dead. <laughs> if that makes any sense too. But, yeah. I mean, um, it's a, it's a kind of spiritual pragmatism. Right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Cause I am like, I feel like my role um, right now is healer and on my path as high priestess is um, I, I'm very much embraced uh, phosphorus. So bringing in the light, it's like 4 a.m., 5 a.m. when the sun starts rising. That's what I've embraced in my healing practice. And so instead of just focusing on empowering the outcasts and protecting them, I mean, I'm sorry, protecting the outcasts, this is about empowering them too so they can have their own power and they don't have to rely on me. So it's kind of, it's layered. So I'm just, I have a lot of boundaries around my home. I'm on my bedroom, like no ancestors in the bedroom. Like, let me have my sleep. I had insomnia for years. I didn't realize it was because, you know, I was just free willy. I was like, okay, everybody come on. And I wasn't sleeping. I would sleep maybe two hours at a time and I would get woken up. So I'd get up and just start, I sew dolls. I do portrait dolls and ancestor dolls. I would just get up and start sewing, but then I'd only had two hours sleep. And then what happens when you don't have enough sleep is you're not on top of your game. And then that's when other things can start coming in. So it's just like this whole, it's almost like this constant and consistent routine. A routine is a ritual, right? So if you became this, if this is part of your routine, you know, okay, I'm feeling this specific way. I'm in tune with my body and my spirit. I need to go take a, an herbal bath and like get this cleansed off me. Or right? maybe I need to clear out the room again and be like, you know, grandma keeps coming in at night, but if she keeps coming in at night, maybe she has a message and I need to get up and sit at the altar. So that's what I'll also recommend for people is, you know, if you have insomnia at night or you're feeling like there's messages, get up and sit at the altar, you know, get a glass of water and listen to the messages they're going to give you. So yeah, it's just being like, I don't know. I feel like I'm contradicting some of my words, but it's like having that relationship with spirit, you know, when you need to go, okay, get out. And then when you need to listen, um, does that make sense? Yeah. You're kind talking of. about discernment, <laughs> right? Yeah. And, I mean, I just feel like it's something we've talked about on Bespoken Bones like a lot is just that like, you know, there are, um, cause it's like the access to the spirit world feels so, it feels like such a gift sometimes to folks, right? If they have the right tools to be with it and not um, be taken by it, right? And I think for years I felt like it was this gift. So I was like, come to me, you know, like I'm fine with it. And it's like, as I developed my practice and my, my path, I was like, oh, wait a minute. No, what am I doing? <laughs> I'm inviting everybody in and that's not safe, you know, um, on so many levels. Um, like I said, then if you're losing sleep, you're not able to be at your best. And that's a lot of times when like spirits will come in. It's like, if you're a heavy drinker, I don't hardly drink anymore. And I realized I drank for almost 30 years because I was quieting this quieting the spirits in a sense, but also letting them almost ride me in a sense too. So like when I stopped drinking heavily, like I'll have two or three drinks a month. I'm not completely, you know, clean and sober. Um, I saw a huge difference in myself personally, socially, and spiritually. So I think like making sure you have enough sleep, enough food, enough, you know, all these things um, are very important for a spiritual practice. So if you're letting the spirits keep you up, that's them taking advantage of you. Unless it's like I said, specific, like, okay, grandma, let me go to the altar or Hecate will have a message for me and I'll just go to her altar. But um, I think like the most important point is having a relationship with spirit so you can know the difference. You know, you bring up alcohol, which is funny because it's spirits, right? Like that's what the other name for alcohol is. 
And I'm just curious if you have anything, we, we haven't talked anything about substance um, really on the show. And it would be really interesting to hear you just like talk a little bit about what you learned. At a very, very young age, I was a punk rocker from day one, basically, since I was 12. And that was part of it. And like, you know, just having, I had a very powerful, strong mother, but the men in my life were always failed me. And so I feel I just, it took me a long time to realize that was part of some abandonment and betrayal issues I had. But, you know, I drank through them all. Since I was 12, I drank heavily. And um, I decided that I wanted to have respect for the spirit the spirit of alcohol. And so what I started doing is changing my mind frame of that. Instead of drinking to escape, it was like a respect. Like, yeah, I'll have a drink, you know, or maybe two drinks sometimes. But I'm not sitting there drinking two bottles. I'm drinking two glasses. <laughs> so I, I had to re-collaborate my relationship with alcohol because I also didn't want to be, I didn't want to abandon it because also it had been a familiar to me for so much of my life that I was like, I'm not going to completely quit. I'm just going to learn how to respect it. Because definitely there's spirits attached to each alcohol. I mean, so, so many things I feel energy is attached to. And there's different spirits attached to each alcohol because of the way it's processed and made and created and depending on where it's created on, you know, what space, what land, all these things um, are associated with it. And um, so, yeah, I had to learn to respect the spirit to be able to kind of hang out with it and party with it and celebrate with it so that it doesn't make me sick or black out or wake up with regrets. Um, I also believe when you're highly intoxicated, it's a good time for spirits to come on in. And if you're not in ceremony and intentional with that, like, yeah, drinking through ceremony, that's different. But if you're out at the bar and you're just like, I am going to go, you know, all out and I don't care. There are so many wandering spirits that can jump in. And that's a lot of times I feel like why you black out is because, you aren't actually doing, you aren't operating your body, another spirit is. So, and I think that some spirits get attracted to that. So, you have a specific spirit that'll come on in because they know you drink on a regular basis and they're able to be in a human body and party or do whatever, you know. And that's why I feel a lot of people will act opposite than they normally would when they weren't intoxicated. Um, so, yeah, I just learned to respect it and go, okay, I'm not going to take advantage of it anymore. There's so much in what you just said. There's two things that I want to tease out. Like, okay, one is um, I just I have had. I mean, I'm always thinking about like the relationship between um, trauma and access to spirit, right? That like that trauma has a particular, and I've delved into this before, but like trauma has a particular. Um, it's a particular threshold that like sometimes folks who go through become very, very sensitive, right? Spiritually and, and sensitive to the spirits. And so that it's a mixed bag, right? Um, so that was one thing that I wanted to to pull out of what you said of like, I've had a lot of clients who, who've come into my sex therapy practice and have been like, oh, I only have sex when I'm drunk, right? And so like what you're, and they, and they don't feel good about that. And so like really what you're saying is this idea of there are spirits that are attracted to um, bodies that are intoxicated and that things can happen to your body when you're intoxicated because of that. It's not just like, oh, you were drunk and you made a bad decision or you blacked out. It's like, oh, there could be a, a spiritual component to it. And I had never thought about that. The last two years, I have had a lot of clients that come to me and they're like, I, you know, they're in their 40s and they're like, I've just realized I've only had sex when I'm drunk. Right. Like, I've never had sex sober, like ever. And I'm all, that just blew my mind thinking about that. I'm like, wow, I think that was me most of my life too, until I, you know, um, I mean, I've been in long term relationships, but for, I think up until like through my 20s, that was the case. You know, like I didn't lose my virginity because I was sober. <laughs> you know, I was wasted. It's just kind of one of those things. It's like, whoa, how did we not realize this? Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but the, this other piece about like, um, res like respecting the spirit of the alcohol um, also seems important because like, uh, I'm just thinking about how, like, for example, I have alcohol that was made on my ancestral lands, right? It's and it has a, a history and a tradition of being made. It's Scottish, but so like it's it's from a particular. They have all these different 
distilleries and it's from the ancestral lands of my actual people. And so like, it's what my people drank, right? And so there's like a way that when I imbibe that, it's a, um, it's really powerful as an agent of connection. And I imagine that that's true with other kinds of spirits, other kinds of alcohol that like are made on ancestral lands. It's like, it, it can be a way, like when you're like you said, ritually, ceremonially to connect with your people. Would you speak to that? And just um, come close. Me now? Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, definitely. Like I, I'm really like a big part of my path is about uh, being intentional and being mindful. So if you're intentionally having ceremony and, you know, drinking, that's different. That's like your intentions are there. You're making an agreement with the spirits that are there. You're telling them what you expect. And I, I mean, that should be a daily thing anyways, especially with like drinking and ceremony. Like, I feel like there's just a whole different um, experience with that. And rather than like being at a bar or like, you know, somewhere public where it's not a safe space, you know, ceremony is a safe space. And um, so it's different when you're drinking or having many drinks in ceremony or shots. You know, I drink a lot of rum when I'm in ceremony. Um, I'm Hungarian Slavic. I, I drank vodka most of my life, but the last few years it's been rum. That's where I feel that's like a medicine almost just for ceremony. But, um, you know, I'm not going to go out to the bar and have six shots of, of rum. I'm just not. Like, I haven't done it for years. So it's when I'm in safe space, when I'm in um, ceremony is when that happens. And so I've made that, th that's the respect I have for where I'm like, okay, when we're in this space with our intentions and our everything's, you know, been set up for ritual, that's when I feel safe to have more than two shots of, or two drinks. Mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I want to pivot and talk a little bit about your ancestors because I know you grew up kind of having a, being in a, a spiritual family, right? With your mom and your grandma. And would you just talk a little bit like about, um, yeah, just anything of how like the, the folk magic or how you experienced really growing up in a um, lineage tradition, I guess. Yeah. So my grandmother was Hungarian. Her family, her parents came over. They had fell madly in love there. And uh, her family, her my great-grandmother's family was Catholic and my great-grandfather's wasn't, so they said they couldn't get married. So the two of them got on a boat and they didn't know any English and they came to New York. And my great-grandfather had the first Hungarian church in New York City. And um, my grandmother was very religious in that way, and then also very much embracing, like, the mediumship, the dream. My grandmother also had prolific dreams, um, and then my mother uh, definitely went more down the road of, like, a witch, you know, witch practice in a sense of, like, claiming that and not saying, you know, not turning her back to it and actually embracing it, and I feel like that's what really helped me develop but I have because like when I was 14 and going through some heavy duty stuff is when she was like, all right, it's time for you to start learning how this and this and this, you know, with spirit works. And so when I started my, when I, I never claimed like pagan or Wiccan or anything like that, but I've always been a spiritualist. And um, probably about 10 years ago, when I really started looking into conjure work and root work, I was like, wow, this is a lot of the things my grandmother did. Like, this is grandma magic. And so my grandma never in a million years would say she was a witch or anything or a practitioner in that sense. But she was definitely a medium and used a lot of the herbal tools and the earth. And that's why I say the old country because she was like, this is what my mom did because this is what her mom taught her. And I see so many... Um, things line up with root work in the same way. So I feel it's very ancestral, like anyone that works in the root work community, it's like very ancestral and passed down, even though, um, you know, like I said, my grandma was Baptist and she was, she went to church all the time, but also she didn't frown upon like spiritualists. Like she didn't frown up, she believed and she knew because she also walked that path of experience of like having these prolific dreams that would come true or like say, you know, someone would pass on and they had been at her bedside that, day, that night, they woke her up and she would know. She'd be like, okay, they, so-and-so you know, passed on, they came and woke me up last night at the foot of my bed and I talked to them for an hour. So it was like this 
I guess, again, it was never frowned upon. I was never said, oh, you know, don't say that. My mom said when I was about two years old, I would tell her these really long stories. And I would tell her, well, mom, that was before I got here. And she said that I would whisper that, you know, it's before I came down here. And she'd be like, okay. <laughs> and so she would ask me more. So it was never, I think what happens a lot, especially with children is, you know, oh, that's your imagination or it gets blocked and it gets stomped out. And I think for me, I feel very lucky because my mom was a practitioner and she embraced all that as I feel like my grandmother also was embracing that. And it was never like, you're crazy or don't think like that. You know, that wasn't real. Um, I come from a line of women that were very loud and proud and like that. Yes, that's real. Like that's, you know, that's not your imagination. Like you actually did see that or you did communicate with so-and-so. So, -and -so. so yeah, yeah, it just sounds question. like it was nurtured from a young age for you yeah found me you know yeah so it's beautiful yeah i'm curious if you would feel comfortable answering this and if you don't we don't have to include it in the interview um but just like it's about the connection between like root work which i i don't know that much about um but just um like how do you navigate that because my sense is it came from west africa is that true so let me ask it. Let, let me ask. Do you feel? Let me just say. Do you feel comfortable talking about that? I definitely. Did you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so let me. Ask yeah, you I definitely feel. Okay. Let me ask you. Let me like the question. Is something like, um, like you are of European ancestry. Can you talk a little bit about, um, how you hold root work and doing that in a good way? I started really getting a deep connection in New Orleans. Like I came here in 98 and then in 09, I started frequently coming here all the time. And like I said, the more I learned about the root work and conjure, I was like, this is the stuff my grandmother was doing and showing me and my mother. Um, and a lot, I mean, the root work is based in like in Africa, African practices and religion. And then it's a mix, like the Southern, Southern root work is a mix of um, Afro, Korean, Caribbean, indigenous, and Euro, because that's like, it's like a mix here in the city. The city is like a mod podge of everybody. So um, when I started realizing a lot of these things I was learning, and I have like elders that I learned with here, or people that have, you know, that are in the, in the path, that path, um, I was already doing a lot of it. So it was just kind of mind blowing where I was like, I actually feel finally connected to some type of practice. It's not a religion. You know, voodoo is a religion, hoodoo is a practice, uh, root work and conjure. Root work is like working with herbs and working with the earth and working with spirit and ancestor. So that's how I feel connected with it. If that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. I, um, I know that part of your art practice is about making spirit dolls and ancestor dolls. And um, really hope folks go to your website and, and we have some beautiful images. Um, but would you just talk like about A, what it is, and B, how you work with them magically? Making the dolls uh, like 17 years ago, I grew up in the Bay Area. I grew up in San Francisco. I was there for the whole queer core scene in the middle, you know, the beginning of the 90s with Tri Bait and everybody. Um, so that's how I started making zines. And then it evolved into like, I was um, home a lot. I was a stay-at-home mom for a while, and I was just like, I'm going to start making these dolls. And so I started making portrait dolls of different people that I admired and loved, like anyone from Darby Crash to Lynn Breedlove um, to Alice Bag. And then um, I got offered an art show like the first year I was doing it. And I'm like, really? Are you sure? <laughs> and so um, it kind of started, it evolved from there. It did evolve from there. And then um, when... Oh, I guess I, I just thought of something. Like, that was when I was 30. And that's, like, really when my spiritual practice, where I was like, I can't ignore it anymore because I kept having prolific dreams when friends had passed. Anyways, um, I started connecting spiritually with the dolls and putting more intentions in them of not just, like, oh, this is my favorite singer. I mean, intentions for those are love and admiration. But um, the more I... The more dolls I made and where my spiritual practice was going and I was learning more about poppets and um, how these are vessels, right? I mean, I think that's why a lot of people are scared of dolls because of the energy and that they are a vessel. They can be a vessel. Not all of them are, but a lot of them are. And um, so, yeah, so my practice, it started leading me down. I started making deities and different um, spiritual icons or, you know, things like that. 
And um, it's kind of developed, I feel like when I was at Cunning Crow Apothecary, where I started leading these ancestor poppet classes specifically for ancestors. And I started realizing how healing that can be for somebody, like to make a doll or a poppet. And like, you know what? If you hated your dad or you hated someone in your family, you can also make that and have a fire ritual and burn it. So you can get rid of some of those emotions and intent, like putting intention and, and fire and putting it in the air. But also what I mostly focus on is like you make a doll. And I like to say either from like your ancestor that you feel, that's your bones and your blood. But then we have mentors, especially like, you know, trans folks and queer folks. Like they're like, I don't want to make dolls in my family. They, I, they disowned me. I, why would I do that? Um, so I feel mentors are who inspire our spirit and soul. Like who gives us our voice if our ancestors don't? If you don't feel connected to your ancestors, that's fine. But let's find a mentor for you. I don't care if it's divine. Let's make a doll of divine if that to you feel empowers you, you know? And then um, in my classes that I, that I, my workshops that I lead for ancestors and mentor dolls um, and poppets, um, you bring all these intentions, we write, you know, um, petitions we put in there. And um, if it is an ancestor and say, hey, you know, you've got grandma's old comb and a couple other like little things or maybe a piece of her old dress, let's use that to charge this thing, um, to charge this piece. Um, and you can use it as like an altar piece. Um, it can be the altar for you. Put a glass of water next to it, you know, like candles around it. Um, you can use it as a healing tool, like I said earlier, like if you feel like you need a, either a deeper connection with family or the grandmothers or who, or if you have a specific member of the family or like if you want to do a fire ritual after you make it and burn it and be like, F all of you, I'm sending you away. Because <laughs> that's a lot of the ancestor work I do. Like even if you don't feel connected with your family and you don't have any interest, let's intentionally disconnect you from them instead of just saying, F them or what I don't know if I could cuss. Um, F them or whatever. Let's intentionally cut the cords from all them and send them off instead of just them lingering outside the gate. And this again comes with boundaries of spirit. It's you know like let's intentionally do a a ritual, a prayer, a ceremony. Make this uh this piece of of I don't know if I'd call it art for fire ceremony, but this poppet. And um, let's clear those, um, you know, those motherfuckers out. <laughs> and um, also use it or, it, like I said, it's all intentional. So I have different people come to me in these classes and they have different intentions for making a topic, you know. Um, the classes are usually pretty intense. Like people are crying or people are like, I haven't realized I didn't really grieve when my dad passed. I was 17, you know, like, and I didn't realize how I've carried that. Now I'm in my 50s. So it's been a beautiful experience and I feel really blessed and privileged to be able to hold space like that for people to heal or to recognize or to actually hold on to some grief and be like, let's look at the grief and let's be in it so that we can get past it, if that makes sense. I say that a lot at the end of my sentences. Does that make sense? Sorry. I'm in like terror reading mode. I'm like, does that make sense? <laughs> Uh, it's okay if it doesn't make sense. It doesn't have to make sense. I know. It doesn't have to make sense. Somebody will get something beautiful out of it. You yeah. Know? Okay. So don't get you can cut out my make sense at the end of each one. Just kidding. Okay. <laughs> okay. Whatever. But <laughs> like, um, let's think of like we could say something more witchy. We could be like, "Does that vibe with you?" <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. So yeah, the puppets are a healing tool and healing if you need to have a fire ceremony after and burn that thing or if you want to keep it and have it as a remembrance and an altar centerpiece. And again, I always remind people, do not have your ancestor altars, your ancestor pieces in your bedrooms. Keep it in the like kitchen area, living room area, the hallway, but you don't want them in your bedroom. You, that's your private space. That's your boundaries. Like this is my space. You all need to talk to me. I'll meet you out in the living room at the altar or whatnot, you know? So that's how I know when I can't sleep at night, it's going to be like my grandmother or my mother or something because that's the only people that like, I'm like, okay, you can break these boundaries because it's mom or it's grandma and I, uh, you have a message for me. So I'm going to get up and listen, you know? <laughs> it's not some rando just being like, hey, she can see me and hear me. I'm going to wake her up <laughs> right. and waste her time, you know, or whatever. Right. So Yeah. 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 I'm curious about the um, 
the mediumship part, if you want to go a little bit deeper into that of, um, you know, like how, I mean, the question is something like, how do you navigate that somatically? Like, how do you allow that information to come in and not get, because I imagine some of the messages could be kind of intense or hard or like, how do you not, like, what do you do? How do you, how do you do it? And what do you do to take care of yourself? When I go into a reading or with a client, I go in with a completely open heart. You know, I pray to Hecate and I pray to the grandmothers and I'm like, give me the messages that this, folk, this person needs for healing, for closure, so they can move on. And um, it's going to always blow my mind, I think. I don't think I'm ever going to get over the fact when I give someone a name and they're like, it's right on and like a uh, location. And it really heightened the last few months. I was reading, I was giving a woman a session last week and I was hearing a name and she was from India and she was like, I need to know who I have messages from. And I said, I just keep hearing like Prashashe or Prashish. I couldn't say it right. And basically that's what her mother called her and that's what she was there to see me for. And I gave her some messages from her mother that like, there's just no way I would know any of that. I couldn't even pronounce it right because I'm such a country girl. I'm like, I was, I just felt stupid. I'm like, I don't know. I can't say it right. She started crying. So it's like, I feel that that is part of my path and my healing is to help people know that like their loved some, and sometimes their loved ones aren't with them. And I have to just be honest. I'm not going to make anything up. I'm like, no one's here. Like, no, and spirits sometimes don't want to talk to me or, but I always approach it uh, compassionately. So, um, when I'm not in session with folks and I'm getting messages, um, and that's a big part of being a medium is listening and like trusting. So of course there's going to be rando things that happen where like, you know, you're going to get some really intense information and you have to go relay it to a person that you don't know or you barely know. And that's always very strange. Um, but I just, I trust, I guess is my biggest thing is I trust, you know, I, I do public ceremonies. I do two or to three pretty large ones a year with like, you know, anywhere from 50 to 200 people in attendance. And each year the ceremony is based around a certain purpose. Like, you know, one year it's for orphans. So it's for um, folks that are like, their parents have passed and it's just really when your parents pass like it's just like nothing else I don't care if you hated your parents when they passed and so everybody in the room that feels they've been affected by that specific thing if it's suicide if it's currently this year I'm doing ceremony around um femme voices women voices trans sisters uh femme men anyone that has has been hurt has been abused because they're not masculine enough or they're being too loud as a woman or anything like that and it's about bringing that together and bringing that power and being all in the room at once and realizing for even just a slight moment you're not alone so like if you're not alone in your grief or your story um and through that i have trust also experienced i've had people like can i you to show me how to do that and i'm like it's really about my relationship i have with spirit like, I trust. I trust Hecate. She is my mother now. Like, I'm a devotee. I trust her. Like, she's not going to let the monster or demonic force come in, you know, like, that's dramatic. But um, I trust her. And I trust that she's going to not, I'm not absorbing that pain. Like, when I'm in a session with somebody one-on-one, -on -one, I'm able to hold space for them and hear them and help them give them the tools so that they can grieve or they can heal in some way or be on the path to healing. Um, and what I do a lot after any big ceremony like that, after, you know, a lot of intense readings, um, I do spirit baths. That's what I'm about. I love um, spiritual tea baths, you can call them. <laughs> um, I'm really about the plants and herbs and the medicine and spirits attached to each of them. Like, you know, if you're having, like, I just had a client that can't sleep and I'm like, take some devil's club tincture, that, that energy fast because devil's club, that's what it's for. You know, you can't just t pull a devil's club out of the earth. You've got to ask for permission. It's got thorns all over it. It's for protection energetically. So if you take a tincture and you're not sleeping at night, 
it's going to help with that energy that, you know, is keeping you up. Um, so yeah, just, I've really, again, intentional practice. Like, um, I just, I was just posting about, I want to create some type of little boot camp for like terror readers and stuff. Cause I think a lot of people go in like doing, ter- I've, I've just experienced it with so many terror readers that don't maybe have like a deep spiritual practice or a regular spiritual, I don't want to say deep, but like a regular spiritual hygiene practice that's so important um because you're taking on all this energy you're taking on a lot of trauma of others and so like learning how to have boundaries with that i feel that what i do is i embrace the spirit of ghost pipe are you familiar with ghost pipe ghost pipe the plant yes yes so i embrace the spirit of ghost pipe because what ghost pipe does is you know grows in the shade under trees and it's a take the taker, not a giver plant. Like most plants and herbs, like they have a give and a take element. Um, it's a plant of the underworld. So when it grows, it, it looks like a long stem, skinny mushroom, and then it faces the cap of the top of it towards the ground. So like it's considered like this underworld plant. But if you get permission, and it's beautiful, it's white and pastel it's all Marie Antoinette Rococo, beautiful. And if you touch it, when human hands touch it, it turns to black sludge. It's very interesting. But if you get permission to harvest it and make a tincture of it, it kind of has like a psychedelic effect. The purpose and the medicine for a ghost pipe is to take your pain, take your trauma, and put it in a box in front of you. It's not going to take it away from you, but it's going to put it in front of you so that you can look at it and figure out, oh, okay. Because, you know, sometimes we look so deep within ourselves it's hard to get out, we ground. And especially with trauma and um, toxic experiences and relationships, you just kind of get, you feel like you're drowning in it. So I really embrace the spirit and the energy and the purpose of ghost pipe with my practice of, all right, let's chat. Let's put all your stuff in this box in between us. And it, when I started doing that, I stopped crying during, se- I used to cry during sessions sometimes because I would just feel that pain of the person. And it was devastating. So now I'm able to go, okay, I'm still very connected. My heart's connected to yours while we're sitting together. But I'm also not going to take on your tra- trauma and pain because that's exhausting. And how am I going to help you if I take it on? So let's put it in a box between us and let's look at it. So I want to create some type of boot camp around that. I want, I'm calling it boot camp. So I'll probably do like a three-day thing where, you know, it's just spiritual hygiene. It's like if you're doing a party and you've just read 20 people, what are you doing afterwards? Are you eating a full meal before and after? Are you taking an herbal tea bath? You know, are you doing all these things so that it doesn't accumulate on you and then weigh you down? And you might be fine for a year or two, might be fine, you know, for a couple of weeks. But if you're not having some type of spiritual hygiene routine, like that energy is going to accumulate on you. Or if you don't have, you know, a deep, connection or practice. I mean, connection, of course, it's our ancestors, it's our bones and our blood, but do you have an altar for them that a living altar that you're feeding, that you're attending to? Um, Cause that's a lot of my practice too, is like I spiritual mentor where people build an altar. That's all pretty. They're like, Ooh, it's pretty. It's got pretty things, but it's not a living altar. It's just kind of like a lookbook or something. You're like, oh yeah, it's great. But are you feeding your altar? Are you tending to your altar? Are you sitting at your altar? Are you praying at it? Are you asking it for help? Because that's what the altar is. It's a meeting place for the living and the dead. It's a place for you to give thanks. It's a place for you to ask for help. Um, give it food, give it sweets, give it coffee, give it like whatever booze, like whatever um, you need to give your altar, you know, because all, they're all different. Um, so having... All of those combination of things, I think, helps me with mediumship to wrap up that question. <laughs> That's awesome. Way to bring it home. Right? I'm like, okay, I'm going way too long. Okay, go around. Yeah. <laughs> I want to um, I want to ask you, like, if you want to, to just okay. see if there's any, like, and if this feels like too much work, don't worry about it. But, like, is there... Um, like, I just know that people get really specific things from listening out from the podcast, right? Like, people have written to me and been like... I listened to this particular episode and I decided not to kill myself that night. Like that's a big deal. Right. So I just, I'm going to invite you if you want to like, just drop in and listen and see if there's anything that wants to be shared. And I mean, this is my message personally on a continuous basis daily is 
about the disconnecting intentionally, spiritually, energetically from the toxic relationships. And I don't care if it was 20 years ago and you haven't seen that person. And if you haven't done a proper, like, it's the spiritual hygiene, it's intention, it's fire ceremony. And a fire ceremony can be like a candle and you write the petition, which is like what you need to get rid of. Maybe write the story, the thing that happened so that you're cutting cords with that story. Because what happens is we hold on to our stories and they are our stories. They are part of who we are, but you don't want them to hold you back. I look at our lives every year as a new, our lives are a novella. So every year is a new chapter. And, um, you know, every good story has some trauma and has some like, oh my God, I can't believe that happened. That doesn't have to be the whole story. So like going into our little rooms that we lock away, because, you know, we lock away bad experiences, we lock away trauma, we toxic behavior. And I look at it as like this monster you lock up and it, there's no windows, it's dark, there's no food, there's no air, there's no nothing. They're dehydrated, they're hungry, they're famished, they're neglected. Even these monsters that we don't want anything to do with, we house them in our temples, in our bodies. And so getting that key and then locking that door and looking that monster, I like to say monster instead of demon because demon just feels so like Christian, patriarchy, like demon. Get that monster. Look at it in the eye and be compassionate with it and be like, I see you. I hear you. You're real. You really fucked me up. And I am going to let you go because you do not serve me. There's no positive serving here. Like, there's no positive relationship. Here you go. You're free. Like, let it go. And, like, you know, everyone has a different place they send them off to. If it's, you know, into a fire, <laughs> into a healing space. Um, I do a lot of that with ancestral stuff where there's been, you know, abuse and molestation and such. Um, let's send that person to the healing realm so they don't keep getting reincarnated into the family if you believe in reincarnation. Um, or that, that energy doesn't get reincarnated because that's what starts happening is it's, it's our story. It's our it's story. Like all of the men in our family do this. Well, there's a way for you to stop that that rhythm or that, you know, or like all the women in my family end up with these type of relationships. Well, have, be the one that stops that ripple and creates a new one that's more, that's healthier in any way that you need to do that. So I feel like being compassionate and that's something that I learned from Ilva. I did compassionate depossession with her and I use that in my spiritual practice and in my mediumship, you know, um, being compassionate even with those monsters because, you know, they need to be let go and to, sometimes you got to be compassionate and hear them and look them in the eye and be like, all right, go. Instead of just being like, fuck you, fuck you, I'm going to keep you locked up. And then it's just holding you back. So many people like want to help others or like are helping others and then they don't reflect and look at themselves and they don't receive the help when it's offered. Like if people are offering to help you with things, let them help you. And, you know, it takes a village as they say. So, um, and baby steps. I'm always like baby steps. Like nothing's going to happen overnight. It might take 20 rooms to go through to unlock, you know, before you start feeling a difference. And when spirit sees that you're doing the work, it's spirit work. Um, it's work. It's like not just, oh, once a year. Oh, it's October. I feel like I need to do this work. No, this is continuous work. This is like yearly. This is daily. This is yearly. Yes. Daily, you know, monthly, like making sure like last Sunday of the month, I'm going to take a spirit bath. I'm going to make sure that I go into this next month, not bringing in all the things that aren't serving me from the last month. You know, having some type of spiritual hygiene is important for that. Thank you. I, um, I want to give you a chance to talk about your upcoming stuff that you've got. Yeah. You know, I mentioned earlier, like New Orleans, like it's literally probably the only place I've ever felt like I belong. And it took me a decade to move here. A decade of me coming like three months out of the year and just like all of my art and everything just being inspired by the history here, the stories here, my experiences here. Um, so I'm really excited to hold uh, the ceremony that I'm doing, um, as I mentioned earlier, for the voices, you know, of the femmes and the trans sisters and femme men and the non-binary folks that like aren't seen and heard or they are being loud, but they're not getting the, the what would the word be? 
it's like bash, you know, backlash and all that, even from within our own community. So this is a place for the voice to be heard and seen and loved and have the compassion for. But I'm going to be able to do that inside of Hotel Peter Paul, which is a 150-year-old chapel, and it's breathtaking. And that's on um, October 28th. And I'm opening for one of my dearest and oldest friends, Vin Santos. He's from San Francisco, too. I don't know if you're familiar with him or his work. He just finished touring with Bauhaus, so he'll do this whole story time thing afterwards with that. So I'm bringing in the ceremony, and then that will happen. And then following that, it's the same night, which I've never done two of these ceremonies one night, so we'll see what happens, um, is Mudlark's 10-year anniversary, which is one of my sacred buildings here in, in New Orleans. It's a puppet theater. It's nearly 150 years old. Um, one of my dearest, dearest friends at her space. Um, so I'll be doing that. And I'm also teaching a, a few ancestor puppet and mentor workshops in the next few weeks following um, down into the end of November. So um, right. I think and those are my, can, yeah. Folks can find out about all that stuff on your website, which is right. cookteflon.com. Cookteflon.com and Instagram. I'm on Instagram for Cook Teflon. I usually have postings about everything coming up and what I'm doing and what I'm working on. Um, I make these regal hag crowns. Uh, they're just like these little headdresses I make out of materials and fabrics and old, old this and that's. Um, and my dolls and I usually make one music video a year for a band because it's a, just, I, I have so much going on. It's like I can't take on being a video maker full time, but once a year that I get that out. <laughs> um, but yeah, so my, what I'm what, coming up is October 28th. If you're in New Orleans, it's a Monday night, seven o'clock at Hotel Peter Paul opening for Vincentos. And then, um, 9.30 that night, I'll be opening the Mudlark's 10th year anniversary party with the ceremony also to empower our voices and our spirits and souls. And so if folks wanted to work with you personally, how could they do that? I do phone sessions, uh, FaceTime. They can do that by emailing me at paincreations at gmail.com, P-A-Y-N-E, C-R-E-A-T-I-O-N-S at gmail.com to set up a time. And I have people that do that weekly, monthly, or they do it occasionally or a one-time reading. Um, I love being able to help everyone from anywhere on the globe. <laughs> Great. So if that's yes. how folks can contact you. Wonderful. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Um, so would love to hear a song that connects you with your ancestors. Can you, can you tell us what we're going to be hearing right now? I am going to have you play a song by Vin Santos. He's been a dear friend. He's the closest thing I have to a brother and to family, I feel. His music makes me cry and makes me laugh. And it, I feel like it represents a lot of who I am and inspires who I am also. Black shoes with black hair. Should have been my sister But now she's not home She's part silver
It's been so great to have you on the show and thanks for rolling with it and just being so fantastically fabulous. I really appreciate um, your gifts. Thank you for having me. Yeah. I'm excited to follow you and all your, all the things that you do is so special and beautiful. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So I just wanted to thank the folks who are listening to this episode and taking the time out of your life to just learn more about the spirits and um, how to be with them in good ways. And so if you, um, if you felt inspired by what you heard here, you should check out Kook's website, kookteflon.com. You can also check out my latest project, which is Wellcelium, which is an online school for transformative skills for sex, intimacy, and relationships. Uh, we're going to be launching later this year. You can find us at Wellcelium on Instagram. And I'm Pavani, and I'll be back every new and full moon with Bespoken Bones, sharing more embodied goodness and ancestral wisdom. <laughs> <laughs>